Good evening, I'm Jim Whaley. Tonight it's a great pleasure to welcome to Cinema Showcase one of our finest actresses, Academy Award winner, Mercedes McCambridge. Among her films, All the King's Men, Giant, Suddenly Last Summer, and a film in which she wasn't even seen, but very much felt The Exorcist. She's written about her exciting career in a wonderful book called The Quality of Mercy. Join me tonight as I talk with Mercedes McCambridge on Cinema Showcase. Thank you for joining Cinema Showcase tonight. And Mercedes McCambridge, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for asking me. It's been far too long since you were here last. <laughs> and, uh, it's good to have you back. Thank you. Thank you. The, um, the book, The Quality of Mercy, your autobiography, as it says in the, in the opening, is not a typical Hollywood memoir, and that, indeed, it is not. And I must, right here at the onset, pay you a compliment. It is, I think, one of the one of the finest autobiographies I've ever read. Oh, thank you. My goodness, thank you very much. Well, because all too often, I think, autobiographies, particularly those dealing with people in the entertainment business, tend mm. to be, and then I wrote, and then I appeared in, and that sort of thing. Yeah, and I really hate that, and it's why I've never, ever, ever wanted to write such a book. I wouldn't have if it had been left to me, but the New York Times came to me, and because I'm impressed with the New York Times, I uh, said, all right, I'll try it. But I don't, uh, I never wanted to write any kind of book about, and then I played with, and mm -hmm. then I was on the road with, or then I opened on Broadway with. I just think those things are so boring. Yeah. Who cares what you played in, in the deep, dark ages? And who cares what the producer said to you? So I tried in The Quality of Mercy to tell the story of a person who stumbled into the business and who has been stumbling a lot through the business, but somebody who has survived over a remarkably long period of time in the business, sometimes in spite of it, sometimes because of it. But I hope that more than that, it's a story of a person who is as lonely and as despairing and as joyful and as angry and as uh, bewildered as anybody. Is show business any more difficult a business to survive in than anything else? Everybody says so, but I look at my friends and the people around me, and I don't know that I could do what they do without feeling that it's difficult to survive in the nursing profession or any branch of the medical profession, or as a school teacher, or as a social worker, or as a lawyer, or as a saleswoman. I think. I think life is very hard to survive. I really do. I think it's, uh, I think it's a rough go a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. What was the most, was there a most difficult part to writing the book? I think in trying to do justice to the people who have made the biggest influence in my life. It's, it's strange to sit in a room with a typewriter and uh, 26 letters of the alphabet in front of you and all of the exclamation points, and try to put black marks on a white paper to describe the woman who gave you birth, or a man whom you loved enormously, or a dog for whom you still grieve, or the kind of situation which made you despair to the point that you wanted to end your life. Uh, how to describe waking up in a hospital, hearing that your second son was born dead, um, as the one before him had been. How do you put those? It's very, uh, it's, it's, it's painful that way because you think, have I, and I still don't know, I wonder if I have done justice to the people who have colored my life. I'm not sure. I don't know what your impression would be of my mother I know what I wanted the impression to be, and it's a many-sided impression. I had a hard time with my mother for mm -hmm. a while, and she with me. But I wonder, I, I think that's the most, that's the most difficult. It, it's not so hard to describe yourself or what you feel, 
but when you are impertinent enough as a writer to describe another person, that's heavy. That's a, that's a lot of gall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. At what point, though, and I guess this is exactly what you're talking about, do you decide where being candid stops mm -hmm. and um, you cross that, that thin line? Well, I wonder, it seems to me that for me it was, I knew that I had to tell the truth. There was a very little point in doing this book. And I believe I have told the truth, although I am a liar by nature. I lie about everything. But when it comes to the real things, I think I try very hard to be truthful to the best of my ability, I do. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to hurt anybody through malice. If someone is hurt by something I've written, I haven't done it maliciously. I think malice offends the person who inflicts it more than it ever hurts the person for whom it is intended. Emerson says that, that the thief ultimately steals from himself, not anyone else. And I think that's true about mm -hmm. viciousness. A vicious person always falls on his own sword. I think Montaigne said that. And I think that's true. But if I have seemed uh, less than kind, for example, people keep talking about how I wrote that Joan Crawford was a mean, rotten egg lady. Well, when I was a little girl, when I got mad at you or anybody else, I'd say, you're nothing but a dirty, really mean, rotten egg person. That's all you are. You're just dirty old, mean, rotten egg. Well, that's how I felt about Joan Crawford. I didn't like her, but she didn't like me first. Mm -hmm. that, that is one of, the more, one of the most fascinating parts of the book, that, um, the making of that film. Mm. Um, but I guess that's what I'm talking about. How, where, do you, where do you draw the line on something like that? I, th I, I, I suppose you consider the alternatives, and it's either truth or it's fiction. I think it is much easier to write a novel. Mm. Think of the license you have in a novel. You change a person's name from Mercedes McCambridge to uh, Gerald Dean Smith, and you change a person's name from Joan Crawford to Helen Brown, and you can write anything you darn please. It must be a wonderful way of releasing an awful lot of stuff from deep inside you. Oh, yeah. You say that very knowingly. Oh, is there anything you want to tell me, Jim? <laughs> oh, yeah. Working on several novels. Are yeah, you? Uh-huh. Is it true that your agent in Hollywood for many years had trouble pronouncing your name? Oh, yes, Kurt Frings. All he could ever say was Cheddar's Kamerich. That's <laughs> as close as he ever came. <laughs> How would you like that? You know, to say to a producer, I've got here a wonderful actress named Cheddar's Kamerich. Never heard of her. I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm told that Michael Curtiz uh, was often completely uh, indecipherable in his directions. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Ustinov writes so humorously about him in his autobiography about how Ustinov uh, could never understand anything Michael Curtiz was saying, and mm -hmm. Curtiz could hardly understand what anybody else was saying. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder he managed to direct so many films. Yes, I understand too. I, I did a film early on with King Vidor. Mm -hmm. I think the second film I made. Lightning Strikes, Lightning strikes Twice. Twice. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think it was Sam Goldwyn who had trouble with his V's and his W's. He got them mixed up, as many people who are first-generation American immigrants. And Sam used to come on the set and say, where is Widor? <laughs> so instead of where is Widor, it came out, where is Widor? <laughs> Last time you were here, you, we've, uh, we talked about the extensive training, really, you got in radio, mm -hmm. and you said that that was probably the most valuable training mm -hmm. that you could get. Why was that so valuable? The immediacy of it. it uh, if you and I now were in the radio days, we would finish this, and then maybe we would go and have a cup of coffee, and then we would come back into this studio or another and pick up a script for the next show in which you would play the Lone Ranger, and I would play uh, Little Beaver or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we would do that, and I'll see you tomorrow when over at another network we will be playing uh, two parts on This Is Your FBI or Inner Sanctum. And that's what it was. You oiled your machinery and you kept it in excellent repair. 
and you added to it, and uh, the mechanism ran well, and you became uh, more fluent in all kinds of characters and dialects and approaches to the uh, uh, nobility of, of uh, nobility is not the word I'm looking for, mobility more so than nobility, even a little of nobility about the human instrument, what it can do, how high it can go and how low it can go and everything in between and using all of that to its best advantage and testing your breath to see how much you have to get to the end of a line. Absolutely fascinating, and no limits unless you impose them yourself, as far as dialects are concerned or anything else. You could do almost anything that you wanted to do. It, it was, uh, radio was a very freeing agent, I think primarily because we had uh, trust in each other and in the directors. Some of the scripts were marvelous, some of them weren't so good, but it was uh, a, a group of technical perfectionists who allowed you to invent artistically and uh, uh, excitingly. Uh, radio, radio was not limiting. Uh, television is very limiting, as you know. If we move out of frame, we've had it. Mm -hmm. uh, films the same way. Even theater is confined within a proscenium, and there are just so many things you can do because you're visually in front of an audience. But in radio, you're not. In radio, you can fly to the moon. You can be on the moon in two seconds in radio with sound effects and a voice. Do you think that's one of the things that actors today or who have come along in the last 15 or 20 years or so are not doing? They're mm. not stretching their, their vocal capabilities? Mm. Not only vocal, I think mental. I, I just, uh, I go from campus to campus from time to time and I'm always chagrined at the group of young people who uh, flip their heads rather grandly and say, I'm in theater. <laughs> They like to talk about it. The thing is, they don't like to work at it. They don't like to sweat much. They don't like to memorize much. They hate taking direction. And it's uh, some kind of social club they've joined. And they see themselves on a series where they're making $150 million per episode. Or uh, that's how they see themselves, as sudden and glorious heroes who can mumble their way through lives, and flick a mustache until it's time to get a rug for the toupee. Mm -hmm. And that's how they go. Was it, do you think, that vocal training in radio that permitted you to so mesmerizingly come up with the voice for the well, demon and the exorcist? It was nothing else. It was a radio performance. It was an altogether radio performance. That's all it was. I had a nest of microphones all being run from the control room at different levels and uh, gains. And I, uh, I did my radio thing. It was all radio, every bit of it. Mm. Was it was it difficult to come up with that? How mm -hmm. long did you have to work at it? Quite a while. I uh, I, I didn't. Uh, I, it, it it always kind of chagrins me and saddens me when people say, "Oh, you were in the moins and the little girl." That was nothing. That was over in about two minutes. Mm -hmm. But there were a great many things that I. I'm hesitating because I was going to say tried to do, that I did do on the soundtrack that are very important to me as far as being an actor is concerned. I constructed and choreographed and scored, if you will, a whole character for, for the demon, for the devil, for Lucifer, the fallen prince of heaven. It was very important to me to see if I couldn't get a great many dimensions into it. And something must have worked right, because people kept passing out and throwing mm -hmm. up and going to their doctors and seeing visions at night. So the work must have paid off. Oh, indeed. It needed in. In fact, there's a rather sad, no, not sad, but well, I guess it is a sad footnote to that, uh, that brilliant performance you gave in The mm -hmm. Exorcist when uh, uh, you didn't receive proper credit for it. It was momentarily sad. It was absolutely disastrous, so far as I was concerned. I didn't get any credit at all in the first 26 prints that went out. No credit at all. Everybody else connected with the silly production got all kinds of credit. I didn't, and I was promised. They showed it to me. They showed me my credit that was not there. Mm -hmm. And it was a lovely big card in the graphics room at Warner Brothers. The film was released. There's nothing there. Uh-huh. 
but then it was there and has been there ever since. So out of the initial sadness has come the marvelous, undeniable fact that we're talking here about yeah. it and we wouldn't have exactly. been if I'd been given the credit. <laughs> Let me ask you about some of the um, really marvelous directors you have worked with in your career. Mm -hmm. And one in particular fascinates me, and that's George Stevens. Oh. On Giant. Giant. Is it true that George Stevens would shoot 50 takes of a, of a given scene? George would shoot until he had every angle covered from his point of view. George was an editor before he was a director, and he directed with an editor's eye. If you are an editor, you uh, hope that you will have enough coverage from the artistic director so that when you get all by yourself in the editing room, you have enough to piece together for a picture that is exciting. George, I really believe, did his editing as he shot the picture. But if you and I are in this scene, and if George is on one of these cameras and suddenly realizes that if he can get his camera behind your head and shoot through the top layer of your hair so that the mist of it is going across the camera's eye, then he will shoot it from your, the point of, of the follicles of your hair if he thinks that's going to make any difference in the finished product. Mm -hmm. Or if he thinks that going underneath this foot of mine and shooting up onto your tie so that actually this will be the nostril shot for you, we'll just, he'd do that. Well, it's his picture and he can do anything he pleases. And it's like, you know, what does a gorilla do? Anything he likes. <laughs> and that's what George Stevens could do, because look at his record. If I exactly. was sitting in the upper offices of any motion picture studio and somebody came to me and said, George Stevens is way over budget and schedule, I'd say, yes, sir. And what else is new? Mm. Let George Stevens do whatever he wanted to do, because he made great films. You write very memorably in, in your book about, um, about James Dean. Mm. Do you think the what has become known as the legend of James Dean would have... Oh, well, how do you feel about that whole I thing? I think it's sick. I hate it. I really do hate it. <sighs> Jimmy Dean lived for 24 years, and it was all over. He's been dead for 26. I don't think that the people who have made a cult of Jimmy Dean ever think of that. They see throughout eternity a 24-year-old boy. Jimmy would have been an age now with Paul Newman and Bud Brand Marlon Brando. Oh, maybe he would have looked like Carl Malden by now. Oh, he was beginning to lose his hair even at 24. But I think this perpetuation of Jimmy Dean, someone they never knew, yeah someone whose acting style has been so bastardized by so many people who have tried to imitate him that it's lost everything but its initial glow. I just think it's very sick. Mm -hmm. And I think Jimmy would too. I think he Do would. Do you really? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. He'd think it was terribly funny, I think. Mm. Yeah. I'd like for you to describe just briefly, if you would, the, uh, the location you had to endure during the making of that film. Giant. Oh dear. Well, there Because are it's so funny in the book. It's one of the funniest chapters of, of any book I've ever read. Well... I guess know, it wasn't it, funny at the time, though, was it? No, it wasn't, but lest anybody think that Marfa, Texas stands alone as a, a rather less than exciting city, there are certainly as many in any other sovereign state in the Union. Mm -hmm. It just happened that we were stuck there for a long time. And I suppose in the Giant was made in 1955. That's a long time ago, half a century ago, <laughs> a quarter century. I'm sure that by now it must look like downtown Atlanta. Mm -hmm. or maybe John Portman built it up. No, I don't know. <laughs> Anyhow, in those days, it was not a terribly exciting place to be for any length of time. And uh, the only thing to do on Saturday night, as I write, is go down to the mash feed store and sit on the sacks, talk about the drought and watch people chew tobacco and spit it out and hunch up their shoulders and pull up their pants and put down their hats and stomp out and into their pickup trucks and watch them go off the dusty road and go home. Not a lot of fun. Uh, not for a whole bunch of Hollywood egomaniacs like us. Mm -hmm. 
But we had some good times because we had to have good times. And Jimmy and I had wonderful times. There's one terrible thing in the book. One morning when we weren't going to work and everybody else was going out to location, Elizabeth Taylor and Rock Hudson and Chill Wills and all and Jane Withers and all the other marvelous people in the picture. And we were left one more time in this terrible little coffee shop that was constantly permeated by the smell of frying grease. Your morning eggs were cooked in the same grease that last night's steak was cooked. Oh, it mm. was just awful. And there were some cinnamon rolls in a basket, and they'd been there for some time, too. <laughs> so Jimmy, for lack of something better to do, unwrapped the cinnamon rolls. You know how they, they are in those mm. toys? He unwrapped them, and we had these two rather long and, and rigid uh, snakes. They looked like long worms on the table. and. Uh, we didn't comment about them or anything. Life was so desultory that we just looked at them for a while. And then as we were leaving, Jimmy picked up one of the snakes and stuck it far up into his nose so that the long thing hung down here, walrus-like. And then he took the other one and did precisely the other nose that same way until they had been fixed inside his nasal cavity. You're welcome. And he picked up the check and started to get up. And I said, oh, no, 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 you're not going to walk up. You, you watch me. And we walked up, and he paid the check with these two things dangling <laughs> from the middle of his face as we walked. We were hard pressed to amuse ourselves, <laughs> as you can tell, but we managed. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you heard from any of the residents of, of, of Martha since the no, book No, I out? hope I won't, <laughs> because as I say, 25 years ago, what was Atlanta yeah. 25 years ago? Well, I... What was Joliet, Illinois? Mm -hmm. I was born in Joliet, Illinois. It's a thriving metropolis now. And I suppose Marfa is too. Yeah. It's just that it's no fun to be in, in way far <coughs> out Texas through the summer for a long time. I think that story, though, best illustrates uh, that movie making is not always the glamorous profession that mm -mm. so many people think it is. Some locations are marvelous, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> Just a couple of weeks ago, they called and said, you want to go to Hawaii to do a Magnum PI? And they take you to Hawaii, and everything is first class, and you feel like royalty, and you live in a lovely suite on the South Pacific shore, mm. and uh, Tom Selleck has to kiss you three times. <laughs> and you've got a really neat part, and you get a lot of money for doing it. That's better than sounds, Marfa, Texas. Sounds better than Marfa, Texas, Much indeed. better, yes. We've only got a little, uh, few minutes left, and I wanted to ask you about another favorite film of mine. You've made several favorite films of mine, suddenly last summer. Oh, yes. Um, <clears throat> there is a famous story that at the end of that film, because she was so distraught or upset over the way the producers or the director had treated Montgomery Clift, that Catherine Hepburn um, indicated her displeasure at them by uh, either slapping somebody or whatever. Did they treat Montgomery Cliff badly in the film? Oh, th what you're saying, and I can only ask you to believe me, is absolutely virgin territory to me. I've never heard that before. Mm. I don't think it was a group of happy people. Everybody was going through a personal crisis of one kind or another on the film. No, I don't think so. No, I don't think so at all. I think that uh, many of us including myself, took Monty up as tenderly as anyone would, feeling compassion for a genius who was dying of his complicated illnesses. No, no, I don't think that people were, I don't, this is the first time I've ever mm -hmm. heard it. I certainly don't, uh, I don't believe that Catherine Hepburn slaps people, I don't know, maybe she does, but this is the first I've heard of it. It's, it's something I had heard about before. Mm. Well, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, who knows? I'm not, uh, once I finish my part, Jim, and once the day's work is finished, I have a tendency to leave. Yeah. And I don't, uh, I don't have very many friends in the business or in the profession, not because I feel that I'm selective about it. It's just not my cup of tea. I don't socialize. I don't like the gossip. I don't like all of the backbiting. And I, uh, I'd rather leave that at the studio. 
This is probably too complicated to get into right now, but we often hear, in talking about Montgomery Cliff or James mm. Dean or Judy Garland or whoever, that Hollywood killed them. Do you think that's true? I would would they have been on that road, you know, no matter what their profession? I don't know. I don't think Hollywood kills anybody anything any more than any other profession kills that you hear about us. Mm. The highest incidence of suicides, for God's sake, is among dentists. Mm. But you don't hear about it. The highest incidence of alcoholics is in the medical profession, and second, in the clergy. But you don't hear about the drunken minister who fell down last night in the middle of the street. You would if it were a bit player on some Starsky and Klutz television sure. show. You'd hear sure. about it. But you don't hear about other people. Oh. This has been another delightful half hour. What's next for you? What, uh, what are you working on now? Oh, what I'm working on now, and I'm not going to get away with it, I don't think, is three weeks in Spain <laughs> on my own. I would like very much to do that, but I'm not sure that I can clear the time. Mm -hmm. I'm also president of Livengren Foundation, which is the finest rehabilitation facility for alcoholics in the country, I think, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And I treasure the position, and I treasure the place, and I uh, feel needed there, and I operate very well there. Well, much success with all of that. And again, congratulations on your book, The Quality of Mercy. It is a marvelous book. Oh, I'm so grateful that you think so. Thank you for being here. Thank you. My thanks to all of you. Until next time, good night.